Round two. Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to day two of five of the spring 2022 Royce final presentations. Uh, today, we are hearing from four new fellows um, about the research that they conducted this past summer. For those who don't know, the Royce Fellowship uh, is uh, an undergraduate fellowship, research summer fellowship uh, founded in 1996 uh, through the generosity of Charles Royce, class of 61, and it funds uh, undergraduate students who are conducting independent uh, community engaged research projects of their own design uh, across the United States and around the world. We have four students presenting today. We're very thankful for that. Uh, and then we have um, the application for the next cohort is actually currently open and it will close on March 4th for any students who are interested. Please feel free to reach out to myself or to Maggie Goddard, our graduate assistant, or any of the fellows that you see present their work today. We're going to start off. We're going to start off with Noya Locke, who's presenting uh, parents' long-term experience in a recreational dance program for their children with autism spectrum disorder. Yeah. Take it away, Noya. Okay, so um, dancing is fun and beneficial. So why is it so hard to find dance classes for children with disabilities? Um, so my project over the summer examined a dance program designed for children with autism spectrum disorder. So before I go into the research, I'm going to talk a little bit about background about myself first and then introduce autism spectrum disorder. So I was a dancer for 14 years. I was trained in classical ballet at the Boston Ballet School. During my freshman fall, I took a course called Artists and Scientists as Partners. The course focuses on the interplay between art and medicine, specifically examining how dance interventions can be beneficial for those with Parkinson's and autism spectrum disorder. I took the two semester course, then TA for a semester, and that's how I built a close bond to the advisor for this project, Professor Julie Strandberg. And she actually approached me with this idea, knowing my background in ballet and interest in medicine. So autism spectrum disorder, most people know it from its classic triad of symptoms, deficits in social communication, social interaction, and the presence of repetitive and rigid behaviors. However, the motor impairments for children diagnosed with ASD is also very pervasive. As you can see, 87% of children in ASD in a recent sample taken in the United States were at risk for some form of motor impairment, yet only 30, around 32% of those children were receiving some sort of physical therapy. So there is this huge gap between the pervasiveness of motor impairments in the usage of therapies targeted to improve these deficits in children with ASD. Um, so recreational dance programs are a really promising option. Dance is very physically beneficial. You gain a lot of gross and fine motor skills, including balance, coordination, muscle control, posture. Um, and also, since dance programs are typically taught in community-based settings, they allow children with ASD to be included in the community. They also allow children with ASD to have social interactions with peers and teachers in a more, in a less rigid, more unstructured um, way that's often not able to happen in therapeutic settings, such as like in speech and occupational therapy. Um, but there are not many dance programs out there, and there's even like fewer research articles or published studies looking at how these dance programs can be tailored to children with ASD and why they're beneficial. So that's what my project really aims to fill the gap. Um, and I was super fortunate to partner with one of the only very, very few programs in the United States that teaches high level ballet to children with autism spectrum disorder. And that's called Ballet for All Kids. So Ballet for All Kids was founded in 2008 by Bonnie Shalakti, who was also an Integra member to this project. She's not here today, she lives in California. Um, so I think it's a little early for her. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so Ballet for All Kids was founded on a method that she created that offers support for children 
of all diagnoses in four different ways that are listed on the screen. Um, and so Valley for All Kids offers ballet instruction to not only children with autism spectrum disorder, but also neurotypical children, children with cerebral palsy, Down syndrome. Um, my research only focused on the children with autism spectrum disorder, um, but they cater to a wide variety of students. So the project, what did the project look like and how did we examine such a large and broad program? So what we ended up deciding to do in me, Professor Stanford, and Bonnie, the founder of Valley for All Kids, we decided to interview parents or legal guardians of children with ASD who have been participating in the program for a long time, which we defined as one continuous year. We really wanted to ask to answer the question, why did they stay? What was it about Ballet for All Kids that kept parents coming back? It was almost answering the question, why is this intervention successful? Why does it retain its participants? Um, and we felt that the parents and legal guardians of the long time participants were the most well suited to answer these questions. So come the summer of, this past summer, I interviewed 20 parents and legal guardians of children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and we, and I asked them a bunch of questions focused on the central idea of why did you stay in the program for so many years? And what we produced was we came up with these five reasons, basically, of why parents, of why parents stayed in ballet for all kids. Um, the first one is authentic ballet training. So parents of children with ASD really feel like some of the like extracurricular activities targeted to their children are very watered down versions of what that activity actually is. But that wasn't the case with ballet for all kids. They felt like their children were getting this rigorous, authentic ballet training that they could see them actually perform the movements and improve their technique. They appreciated that. They kept coming back to ballet for kids for all kids for that. The second reason is a person-centered program, which basically means individualized instructions. So ASD is a very unpredictable diagnosis where the child, what the support the child needs changes from class to class, from week to week. Parents thought that the staff at Valley for All Kids was willing to accommodate whatever support their child needed at that particular moment at, at all times. They did never felt like their child was a burden, was a problem, was an issue. Um, and they really felt like the instruction was individualized to, to meet their child's specific needs to then allow for their child to meaningfully and fully participate. The third reason is sensory integration and self-regulation. So many, parents cited that their children were naturally inclined and had this interest in the arts. Just like neurotypical children who have a vast array of interests, children with autism spectrum disorder also have this vast array of interests. And one of that is the arts. Um, so they felt that ballet for all kids because their child had this interest and then because there was common music, the classical music, the movements calmed them down. They felt their child was better able to self-regulate themselves and cause less behavioral interruptions in class. Um, fourth um, reason that they continue to come back is skill development. So this one needs a little bit more, this theme in particular needs a little bit more refining. ASD is a very diverse diagnosis. And I, we only interviewed 20 parents. So the, um, so the skills that were mentioned were very broad, um, including balance, fine motor skill, fine motor skills, coordination, movement planning, posture. Some parents mentioned that their kids had a tendency to walk on their toes and then ballet allowed them to develop the muscles to then walk more heel to toe, like um, neurotypical children walk and how we all walk. But they, the most important thing is they saw their child over the years improve on tangible skills that they could witness. And they really appreciated that. And the fifth thing and the final reason is interpersonal relationships. So they felt that because Valley for All Kids was in the community, 
that their child had some unstructured time with peers, that everyone at Ballet for Old Kids was very positive, welcoming, and supportive. Their child was able to build social connections that normally they're unable to, even in settings like school or social group therapy. It was really a kind of a safe haven for positive social connections. And I just chose three quotes that I think really highlight um, some of these themes. I do want to mention and read out the middle quote because I think it was one of the most powerful quotes that I heard while I was interviewing these participants. And one parent said that her daughter would put her Kindle down, her Sesame Street down, like all the things that are her usual distractions. She's multitasking. She does a lot of things at the same time, but she's like stopping and actually being still and listening. When it's music and the arts, this is what reaches her. It reaches her on another level that she's like, wait, I don't need all these other things that I used to shut the world out. And now I want to participate. And this is really where Ballet for All Kids shines. It allows these children to use their interests in a meaningful activity to connect with the community that they don't, they often don't have a chance to. If it weren't for Ballet for All Kids, this child wouldn't be able to express herself artistically like she wanted to. Um, so those were all the themes and reasons that we came up with with why parents stayed. So after analyzing the data, after coming up with those themes, after pulling out those really illustrative quotes, What's next for this project? So we are hoping to publish this in a scientific journal, specifically the Journal of Developmental Disabilities. Um, we are in the process of editing it, getting a co-author to come on board. Um, but yeah, we're really hoping to start building that scientific evidence base that Ballet for All Kids wants and um, deserves. And also, we hope this inspires future researchers to study Valley for all kids in more rigorous ways, including randomized clinical trials, um, and just really spark the conversation around recreational advanced programs for children with, not just children with autism spectrum disorder, but also other disabilities and how that can benefit them in the long term. For me personally, I came to Brown really thinking that like that artistic side of me, the person who was so committed to ballet, was over. I was very burnt out with this art form. I had a very negative view of it. But this project and artists and scientists as partners that course really showed me how I can integrate art and my interest in it in a meaningful, positive way that also aligns with my future goals of going to medical school and like contributing to the scientific literature. So that was really valuable for me. And also, I learned that I actually really liked qualitative research. I've never done a qualitative research study before. I've never compiled interview data or analyzed it in any way. And I will say it is way more interesting and engaging than conducting quantitative research, which I have done in the past, which can be very mundane and repetitive. Actually talking to people, sifting through the quotes, it was a very active and engaging process. And it's definitely something I want to do more in the future and we'll seek projects out. Um, so this is just an acknowledgements page of everyone who made this um, project possible. None of the study participants can make it today. They're very busy, but they were so generous with their time. 20, mostly moms, but some dads sat down with me for sometimes over an hour. They were so generous with their stories um, and answering all my questions. And, this really couldn't have been made, made possible without them. And if you think, and I just want to end with this, if you think recreational dance programs for children with autism spectrum disorder is a very niche topic, I just want you to think about your own childhood and think about the ex an extracurricular activity that you enjoy that made you feel a part of a larger community. And think about how children with disabilities aren't given that same option. Ballet for All Kids is filling that gap for a few families. And I was really fortunate to, to research them this summer. Thank and you. next, um, Nelson Lynn will present his project. We will hold uh, Q&A until the end. The students will present from 12 to 1, and at 1 o'clock, we'll open question and answer for all students. <laughs> Slide 
answer should be up in the same window. Hi everyone, my name is Nelson Lin. Uh, I'm a junior in public health and neuroscience at Brown. I was fortunate enough to be funded through the Joyce Fellowship uh, to conduct research last summer on trauma and folks who responded to COVID cases. Um, instead of reading out a bunch of statistics on um, the opioid epidemic, I would be honored to be able to, or at least ground their conversation today in um, an excerpt of a song by Michael Moore. Um, this thing where the song obviously makes it. Uh, uh, drug readers, so just a content warning. I know it's not a good bit, but I thought it'd be nice to frame our conversation today. Okay, cool. They said it was in the gateway truck. Mommy wants to take his son, say, hey, wake up, don't lie. He's bugging the ash, then kick it up. And I'm not Congress, so we take the drugs. To a song by a bass going on, but I see my son break. What's a strain of blood? I could have been gone. I'm dirty, spaded in a bathtub. That's Prince, like a mess with demons. Maybe let your breath up. See that snare, says DJ. Hey, I'm goddamn, I'm making the chillin'. Now it's getting the tension with Sarah Kitty. I'm silly, but this shit's been going on from Seattle. I'm just not silly. It just moved the dog to see. Just put out to the birds. Now it's everybody's problem. Got a nation on the verge. They act in the soccer market. All right, cool. Um, so my research this summer looks at trauma and stress-related disorders in late percent overdose responders. And so looking at the current opioid overdose crisis, especially in Rhode Island, we see that um, last year we had a 25% increase in the amount of folks who unfortunately died due to opioid overdose. So 384 lives were lost last year. And opioid overdoses are characterized by these incredibly stressful scenarios in which a person stops breathing and it looks similar to a heart attack. Um, as a result of uh, in injecting or um, intaking too large of a dose of an opioid. And so the public health response at the current moment is a very individualistic one where currently people are being trained to use Narcan, which is this opioid antagonist drug, uh, which you can inject and it will um, in some cases, reverse an opioid overdose. However, um, this is not a very complete approach. There are a lot of gaps. And another way in which you can respond is by giving people CPR. Because they cannot breathe, uh, we are essentially breathing for them. But these two current public health responses that um, the medical system focuses on are, again, very individualistic and puts a lot of the strain and burden in our society for responding to an opioid overdose on the individual. We need a system in which we recognize that these individuals are being affected by the burden being placed on them in a public health response. Um, our current system focuses a lot on overdose education, training people to figure out what the signs of an overdose are, calling 911 very early. Um, and it tells people who use drugs and never use alone. But the secondary effects of what happens after the overdose occurs is simply not addressed within our current research or current public health campaigns. And that's what my research focused on this summer. So we know about trauma exposure and trauma-related psychiatric disorders like PTSD and other groups. Particularly, uh, we know about uh, people who are trained professional responders, so people like firefighters or police officers or EMS people who are trained in responding to overdoses. But for the large majority of overdoses, these happen in home. These happen in public places where someone just comes across a family, a friend, a family member, a friend, or a loved one who was overdosed. And this begs the question of for these people who are not accustomed to responding to overdoses, what happens in that population? What are the secondary mental health outcomes? So, what happens to citizens like you or me when we respond to an opioid overdose? Looking at the literature, there's essentially no literature, um, quantitative literature at least, on the topic. There have been some preliminary. Um, commentaries on this issue raising concerns, but uh, we simply do not have the data, the quantitative data on what um, the burden of mental health outcomes or trauma looks like in this population. So 
um, looking at my project for this summer, I looked at two main areas of inquiry. First, what the prevalence of trauma and stress-related disorders was. So things like PTSD um, framed the major outcomes that we were looking at. And then the second major concern was how do we reach this population? People who use drugs or um, people who are adjacent to those who use drugs and may have overdosed are incredibly stigmatized in American society. And figuring out a way in which we can reach them and um, identify what has happened during the overdose and um, get those narratives and stories across into quantifiable data is a challenge that I've tried to address over this past summer. And so we did things like targeting people who use drugs through outreach to local harm reduction organizations, um, advertising on social media platforms, and looking to community health serve uh, community health organizations, as well as recovery groups to find populations that may have had this exposure in the past. So um, now for the more epidemiological aspects of the study, we conducted a cross-sectional study. So what that means is that we looked at a very certain specific point in time and looked at um, demographic factors, what has happened, the history of the person who has experienced this response event or responding to an opioid overdose. And then we also looked at the um, outcomes in this case, which we uh, defined as, for example, PTSD um, at that same point in time. So the benefit of such an approach is that um, it's easy to reach a larger, broader audience and it gives you a good Big, big overarching view as to what is happening in this population. But the term causality is something that's a little more challenging and would require a different form of analysis. And so our population was in adults who were English speaking due to just logistical concerns because unfortunately I don't speak another language. Um, and people who were not emergency responders. So just family, friends, or complete strangers who responded to opioid orders. Opioid we also excluded people who responded only in the last two months due to the fact that trauma development uh, occurs over a larger period of time and requires uh, repeated exposure. And so um, through this study, we were able to identify 61 participants in Rhode Island. And uh, we'll start by talking about the people that we uh, interviewed and surveyed. So um, a lot of quantitative data, these are mostly adults um, who are relatively heterogeneous in terms of their sex or gender, as well as um, race or ethnicity, sort of in line with what we see in Rhode Island. We also saw that most overdoses took place in a private location. So these, again, these are people overdosing in their homes, in their apartments, or um, in, in some cases, if they're in public, you see people overdosing in restaurants and things like that. Um, people indicated that oftentimes these are their family or their partner who uh, overdosed in that case. And in some cases, they also used alongside the person they overdosed with. So there was this intimate connection that exacerbates the uh, trauma that one feels when you recognize that someone you know are intimately uh, using with at that period of time is the one that has overdosed. And then in terms of this response to an overdose, again, we talked about uh, calling 911 as a response to overdose. We talked about um, into, like taking an Narcan um, that you have and injecting it to save a person's life or giving people a rest breath. These are all public health responses that require an, in an individual to be very close and uh, very engaged with the response to a health outcome, which um, is obviously a very stressful scenario when you are a person with no formal training or not a professional and are required to do and take on that responsibility of being a lifesaver. And we saw that there are a multitude or mostly three emergency uh, response, um, I would say, branches that people were exposed to. And those are uh, law enforcement officers um, going to the emergency department or uh, being exposed to um, calling, an EMS, uh, calling for EMS support. The people who we interviewed and responded to an overdose had a variety of backgrounds, but I wanted to outline some of the most key trends. The most important is that this is something that uh, people have been exposed to multiple times over. So 70% of our population had responded to an overdose in the last 12 months. We saw that a lot of people had tried in the past to also get trained as to how to, um, how to respond to an overdose. So that's OEMD training or overdose education alongside training. And a lot of our population is um, either identifies as in recovery or have, as actively 
using. And um, many of our participants actually had experienced an overdose in the past. So again, there is this intimate connection between a person's lived experiences as well as the public health response that they are being burdened and tasked with doing by our state. One of our major trends that we looked at was what was their response or experience with first responders during an overdose event. So these are the people that were called by a lay person, they're calling a professional to try and help them with that response. And it's, you can see stark differences in the response of a person based on who they call or who arrives at the scene first. Um, most importantly, I wanted to outline that a lot of the more negative outcomes or negative experiences are, are, are associated with law enforcement officers and the presence of, um, for example, an annoyed law enforcement officer who um, there's a lot of stigma um, seen by our population whenever a law enforcement officer is called to the scene. A lot of people felt harassed or a lot of people even felt or were detained during their exposure to a law enforcement officer because, for example, some people may, be, may have been actively using um, and there's uh, some questionable amount of protection given to people who are on the scene of the overdose themselves. People had slightly more uh, comfort in an emergency department setting, but again, there is stigma within uh, the ends of medical providers on uh, looking at an opioid, a person who has responded to an opioid overdose or the person who has overdosed themselves. Um, but most people felt more comfortable with EMS responders. So um, the first uh, EMT comes, um, people felt generally positive with um, their interaction with them. And I know these percentages don't have 100%, but people have had, um, in our survey indicated whether or not they felt comfortable in certain aspects of the response. So people could have indicated that some aspects of the uh, EMS response was positive and some aspects were negative. So there's two separate questions in that case. We did not want to limit to a sort of binary. Right? And then finally, looking at our primary outcome, let's say uh, we looked at post-traumatic distress disorder within the last month. And uh, this is a very preliminary analysis um, with some help from uh, people with clinical training at URI. We were able to um, look at PTSD in this population. And we found that a very large proportion, about 30%, specifically had PTSD related to their overdose responding incident themselves. So uh, that is a very large mental health burden that we think is undervalued and not addressed by our current public health response and is not really seen anywhere else in the literature. So we think this is a huge finding and something that should raise concern for the ways in which we approach our overdose prevention in the future. Um, whether or not we need to uh, implement more safeguards for the people who are on the front lines and responding and are exposed to this on a day-to-day -day basis is something that we think um, deserves more funding and attention. We also saw that there's um, within these people who experience PTSD, there are extremely high levels of anxiety and depression in these same populations. So these are these comorbidities that are, um, again, stacking on top and top and top each other as a result of the strain being placed on these people. Um, and finally, in terms of research dissemination, again, this is a pilot study, so with that and a cross-sectional study. So our research here is mainly meant to inform future research and build on that foundation that says, yes, this is an area that needs more inquiry. And so um, we did that in a couple of ways. Um, so um, we did that through outreaching with um, a local rally for recovery, which happened last September, and handing out one pages and talking to members of the public. We also uh, presented in more academic settings, for example, the 2021 Substance Use Symposium. And, that, and finally, we also presented at a uh, more local stakeholder meeting through the Governor's Voters Task Force here in Rhode Island. So there's runs the gamut of stakeholders who are involved with opioid responders, so people in public, the academics, the uh, policymakers. And in the future, we want to do a little bit more. We want to reach out to um, the community advisory board at a local uh, research organization that focuses on transforming these research findings into more actionable um, interventions and also holding community forums with local harm reduction organizations that will um, actually be able to um, inform the people who are most likely to respond. And so, yeah, our pilot study is a conversation that hopefully will inform our future research. So in conclusion, we found that we were able to recruit people from target populations of relatively diverse population, but also hear their stories of what they experienced during their overdose responding. We saw that PTSD symptoms and these secondary mental health outcomes that are relatively underaddressed, need to be addressed due to the higher prevalence and lack of uh, mental health support. And future directions for this work, usually 
Um, I think one promising approach and work that our lab is currently doing is looking at how we can create trauma informed um, overdose education, logs and distribution trainings for people, um, and informing our practice of overdose prevention in the future. So, special thanks to Charles Boris and the Royce Gold for funding and giving the financial support to connect this research. There are a whole list of people to thank. The folks who participated in the study, our community partners, the Sawyer Center, as well as the folks in my research collective, the People Place and Health Collective at the School of Public Health. And um, a lot of folks were involved in the study and helping out along the way. Um, I also want to shout out um, my PI or my main research mentor, Brendan Jackman, for all his help during this uh, process. So thank you so much. And um, this is Ashley. First, My research is on land-based education and the interconnected relationship between land, language, and culture in Santa Clara Pueblo. I'm Ashton Lovato. I'm a junior concentrating in linguistic anthropology, and I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo. Please pay attention to the cornfield that is illustrated in the background, as it is one of the main um, settings for where my research took place. So Santa Clara Pueblo speaks the Tewa language. Um, there's two different branches of the Tewa language, the Rio Grande Tewa language and the Hopi Tewa language. Um, this also happens to be an unwritten language. So with only about confirmation, actually um, 1,300 members, um, it is very important to start having the, com the conversation around preserving the language and the cultural knowledge, um, especially with the times that COVID-19 has brought upon us. Um, so COVID-19 has actually restricted us from gathering and practicing our cultural ceremonies, um, which is an issue because this is really the cornerstone for language and cultural knowledge sharing. So there was, um, you know, this raised a concern for how exactly to shift the language back into the home, especially if there isn't many fluent speakers. So I've always been curious about language and traditional knowledge. I'm also very fortunate to come from a family of speakers and a family who holds an abundance of knowledge, um, that being traditional knowledge. So I've also been fortunate in the way that I've had many mentors in my life. Um, I guess you could say like both connected to like blood related family, but also cultural related family. Um, and through this, there was, you know, conversations and concerns about language loss. Through these conversations and my passions, it has then um, brought me to where I am now today, presenting on this research. Something else I do want to point out is how, when I started farming this summer, it wasn't something that was actually tied to my research at first. Um, it was interesting enough that I, it was more for like personal reasons. I had thought, you know, this is more of a man's duty. So um, I actually had a mentor, you know, take me under his wing and tell me, I want to show you and teach you how to do this. And I think, you know, it wasn't until the end of the summer that I actually saw how farming answered one of my questions. So there were three questions that I researched this summer. One being, what is the cause of language loss in the past and present? What's causing a generational gap between elders and children? And what are ways to preserve the language and cultural knowledge that abide by the ideologies of the community? I've conducted interviews with about nine individuals, two of them actually happening, I think about twice, and two other individuals I interviewed about five times over the course of the entire summer. 
Um, most of the interviews were done at the dinner table. Um, this is also just bringing in cultural knowledge and practices. The purpose for having it at the dinner table was because we believe that you digest the words and the knowledge when you're digesting your food as well. So it was important to also have that. With the interviews, I also did field work, pun intended, for the anthropologists watching out there. Um, and through the interviews and field work, I was actually able to do participant observation, which I will talk about later in my presentation. Um, additionally, it was just also looking at previous research that was done, um, mostly on like the linguistic structure of the Rio Grande Tail language and the Hopi Tail language. So now jumping into the questions of what is causing language loss? Through the interviews, I had actually seen that in the past, it was the drafting of men to war. Additionally, it was the adoption of Catholicism and how there were just hardcore Catholic families who really didn't practice the cultural events as much as other families might have. Additionally, was education, which has two scopes, one being residential boarding schools and how it was more of the forceful taking the famous phrase of kill the Indian, save the men. On the other side, it was also the scope of the want and need for higher education and how English at that time was deemed as the success language. It was more acceptable to speak this language to society, which actually brings me to the present of how English is just the dominant language. Um, when I was interviewing a few people, one of the parents had actually said that English is just sometimes quicker. You know, you work eight hours a day, you're in this environment of just speaking English all the time. So it just seems quicker and it's just more natural. In addition to that, and I think it's very important to raise is just, this question is also very hard to answer. And a parent also said, you know, I don't know why I don't speak. They live in a multi-generational household, but the answer is just, I don't know. Which leads me into the next point of how a lot of people in the community and who I interviewed put the self blame on themselves, specifically the parents were you know, not, wanting, not wanting, but it's more like just not speaking to the children. So this also jumps into another point of how a lot of times the parents rely on the cultural events to teach their children. Um, and this goes back to the conversation and the concern of fluent speakers in the household and who is, I guess, fortunate enough to have those fluent speakers and who is not. Also the question of, who is fortunate to live in multi-generational house, multi households um, and who is not. Additionally, it was this, you know, this question did vary by age and it also did vary by gender and positionality in the community, whether this individual was a tribal, uh, tribal leader or if they were a cultural leader. And one of the, the quotes that came out from the interviews was, I thought they would always be here. And that is, that came from a interview where a lady was talking about how a family member had passed away. And I think now in time with like COVID, we realized that, you know, to, tomorrow's never promise. And sometimes we kind of put off learning from our elders because we're just like, they're going to always be here. Um, so, you know, I just kind of got chills, but, you know, going back to that, it's very important to think about that um, in language loss as well. So next is what is causing a generational gap? Ideologies are completely different amongst generations. Um, when I was interviewing an adolescent, they had actually um, told me, I feel sometimes elders expect you to remember everything and scold you with, you should know this by now, especially if you're associated with a family of fluent speakers. Out of this conversation did come this feeling, like feeling the lack of support and care and nurturing um, for the young individuals, but also um, this feeling of like fear of judgment, fear that they would be judged by a fluent speaker for their pronunciation. Um, and another point of this conversation was also that family dynamics are just really strange and it is harmful to assume that a child can learn from their family. So, you know, more or less be honored that an individual is coming to you to ask you for help with, you know, cultural knowledge or language learning. On the flip side, we see the elder interviewee who had said that no one's interested in this knowledge anymore. They just don't have anyone to speak with or to share this knowledge with. So technically, 
they're holding it, they're passing on with this knowledge, which is also very harmful to the community. Um, and I mean, practically the world and, you know, in ways that we keep it in balance. Although I had asked an elder about the adolescent interview and what they had said about care and like the lack of support. And this elder had said, we push you not because we don't want you to learn. We push you because we know you can learn and we want you to learn. So I think here's just, again, looking at the ways that each generation grew up and the difference amongst them. So, you know, analyzing these two interviews, it has definitely led to this thing that there's a lack of miscommunication or there's a lack of mutual understanding and communication and how that's actually creating intimidation. So I was able to actually observe intimidation. Um, there was a 14 year old that I had interviewed. I'd interviewed the, uh, the family, but this 14 year old was scared to speak in front of the mother who is also fluent. Um, this mother was a little bit hesitant to say certain things in the language around the father who happens to be about 13 years older than the mother. Um, the father is also very fluent but he stumbled or second guessed his words and what he was saying in front of the grandmother. So through this, you know, there's this invisible hurdle that is very hard to get over. And that hurdle is simply speaking. So then this led me into my last question, trying to figure out ways um, to motivate people to speak or ways to preserve the, um, to preserve the language without actually writing it. And this is where my farming, uh, summer of farming comes into play. Um, you know, I, coming from a traditional family, I have always understood the importance of language and the um, importance of culture and how they're inseparable, but also the importance of land. Um, but it's just something about being in the field that is just like the abundance of knowledge that is there, but also just the feeling and like understanding how connected we truly are to land is amazing. Um, but I do want to share a little bit of a story. And this story is about a time in my research where I was just very overwhelmed. Um, it became very personal. I started reflecting on like me being not as fluent. Um, is my work as valid? And it was just more again like my personal connection with language learning and with the fear of language loss. Um, and my <laughs> It's just interesting, but the field definitely did reflect that. There was a really intense hailstorm. Um, it caused you know, a lot of shredded leaves, as you might be able to see um, in the upper hand corner. And there was just this feeling of hurt because when you're doing this work every day, it's like you technically think of these plants as your children. So it's like feeling that hurt. Um, and my mentor, he took me under his wing that day again, and he sat me down by the corner because he could see how hurt I was. And he explained to me um, in the language, there's this phrase, uh, and this isn't the exact translation of the word, but what it means is to like scoop the dirt to support the, I guess the plant to grow straight again because it was on the side. So as we were doing that, he, said how this is actually a story about how global leaders and the people um, are supposed to operate. The leaders are there to punako, to help the, the tribal members when you know there's bad things going on and they need help. But also it was the correlation of parenthood and how parents are there to clear the weeds from their children because you know those are things that are taking up the nutrients, um, all the good from their children but also to punako, to help their child grow straight on a good path instead of leaning over onto a bad path. This was, you know, such an important part of my research where I really understood the connections that land and that land and cultural knowledge had. Um, and, you know, after that, we punako the rest of the, the plants and, you know, power of prayer. We we're there almost every day, just making sure that everything um, was going to be able to sprout. And weeks later, I did it. There was so much prosperity, but also not only in the field, but also in my research, I was becoming more clear about what my research was. Yeah. So these are just some photos that show 
what we got, how tall the corn was. Um, but I also want to just talk about um, at the end of the summer, one of my mentors who I was planting with had told me, um, pulled me to the side and he pointed to the corn and said, this is where you're going to come back to. This is where your heart is. This is where your home is. You're going to learn about so many things here. And this is something I will forever cherish. But about an hour later, one of my other big mentors, he actually came to join my mom, me and my grandma for lunch. And he, you know, we're talking, we're eating at the dinner table. And he told me, everything you need to know in life is at that napa, is at that field. And, you know, I, it was just interesting because I think at that point I had realized that land has knowledge, land knows its name, land and everything in nature, you know, it, it's just whether we're willing to listen. Um, and in addition to that, I also did create a table game based off of the name five um, games. So an example is just like name five farming tools in the tail language. We did play this around these time, which was super fun. Um, still working on like the logistics of it, the, the rules. Um, but through all this, I do want to reiterate that the traditional calendar is land-based education. Land-based education is indigenous knowledge. So talking about my research and how personal it is, this is definitely something that is not going to end here. Um, I am fortunate to be in four classes that are asking for a research proposal. And <laughs> yes, so uh, whether that be on land, language, or ethnographic research methods, um, one of my focuses is hopefully going to be on gender and land race education. Although I've also been very passionate from a young age on advocacy and policy. So I'm in a class right now where I'm able to work with my community to focus on land education and policy. Um, so also just with that is just, you know, looking at internships that will also support the further research. There are so many people that, you know, I would like to thank, um, first and foremost, the people on Zoom who joined from New Mexico, um, to my family, Navi Gia Fembe Anya, Navi Gia Kujo Oji Tinini Bobi, Da Tang Hera Da Abainta, to my mentors, to my community of Santa Clara Pueblo, to my friends, to Professor Paja Faudry, Shiro Sefoya, Jesus and Maggie, um, Chef Royce, and to my Royce cohort fam. Um, lastly, I just want to leave off with this thought is that. Language needs to be taught and learned with love and care. The first people to love and care for us are our mothers. They're the first people to speak to us. So in the same regard, we as Native people view the, the land, the earth as our mother. So Mother Earth has all of the knowledge, all of the care, all of the support to teach us the language. Again, it's just whether we're willing to listen um, so with that, next up is Rashan Sapkota on pivoting project purpose due to the pandemic, prison health disparities. Thank you. Thanks, Ashton. Can you stop sharing that screen so Rashan can share this? One second. Share. Okay. At the bottom, it's a red thing. Below that. Below that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Can you guys hear me? We're good? Perfect. Okay, let me share my screen real quick. Can we see this? Perfect. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Roshan Sapkota, and today I'll be presenting over my project, Prison Health Disparities. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge some people that made this project really possible. Um, first, I'd like to thank my mentor, Dina Chili, uh, Dr. Zink. I'd like to thank Maggie and Jesus, who have been just amazing during this whole process. I'd like to also thank Abhidav Sriram, who has been really instrumental in helping me code the website that I created and also the graphic design component, my Royce cohort family. Um, they've been great through all those meetings. 
Um, and also Heather Richard, who has been kind of great in helping me pivot uh, through these uh, hoops that I've had to go through. About three in 10 prisoners have tested positive for COVID-19 at a rate five times that of the national level. This statistic is most certainly outdated, but when my then co-partner on the Royce project and I saw this statistic for the first time in 2021, we were, for a lack of better words, um, in shock. Not in shock because there was COVID within prisons. My biology background understood that biologically, prisons are a great incubator for respiratory virus. And my public health background knew that prison healthcare is poorly staffed and not given much priority. Rather, we were in shock with the lack of effort on the prison side to do anything about this. So in early 2021, Isaiah and I were actually not thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic within prisons. Rather, we and 13 other students had just created a student organization, Brown Boost Immunity, working on leaving vaccine hesitancy within the Rhode Island area. The main vehicle by which we did this through was a group independent study project through Brown, in which we made a course where we got to design and implement this campaign. But as the school semester started to close, the gifts came to an end, and Isaiah and I wondered about you know, the future directions of our work. We were still very interested in working on alleviating vaccine hesitancy as we saw it as really the last barrier to putting this pandemic to rest. However, we realized that Rhode Island was already doing a fairly good job in this fight, and we wanted to be of service where there was the greatest need. At this time, though, we did begin to see headlines such as these, stating that many states did not prioritize prisons in vaccine rollouts, and that as states expanded vaccine eligibility, many people in prisons still were waiting to receive the vaccine. Now, a common thread buried within these articles was that even if vaccines were available to people within prisons, there remained a deep distrust of medical intervention, citing misinformation and previous medical care experiences. Now, at this point, many people would say, so what? You're telling me that if we expand vaccine eligibility, make vaccines available for this population, they still won't take it? You know, mainly these statements are driven by a veil of ignorance, not realizing that people in prisons are humans just like us. But another point is that if there has been anything that this pandemic has shown us is that prison health impacts community health. Additionally, people in prisons are routinely neglected to uh, traditional forms of medical outreach and have to rely on a minimal source of information to make crucial health decisions. To Isaiah and I, this just did not seem right. And you know, the literature consistently showed us that a primary reason for vaccine hesitancy among incarcerated people was due to a worry about the efficacy or safety outcomes factors that we saw as being a direct result of the lack of outreach and deep distrust. This is when we, through Isaiah's connection to the El Paso County Detention Facility, set out to create and implement a vaccine educational series. However, as independent research goes, there was immediate pivoting project details from the start. As in the beginning of May, Isaiah was offered an internship that he decided to take, which limited my connection to the El Paso Detention Facility and connection to any prisons. I went back to the planning board. I'm sure Maggie and Jesus can remember all those meetings that I scheduled with them. I scheduled meetings with Dina Chile, Dr. Zing, individuals at the COVID Prison Project Initiative, just anyone who would help me know what I could do to move forward. Ultimately, I decided that it was still early on, early on and I needed to learn more about the deep distrust that was uh, fueling hesitancy among the incarcerated population. So Maggie and I um, compiled a reading list which explored aspects such as systemic racism within the criminal justice system, factors that play into hesitancy and much more. While concurrently learning about these issues, I decided you know, I should try to work within my home state of Nebraska. Thus I started out reaching to the, the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services to impl implement the vaccine educational series there. You know, and this is just <laughs> the name of the game. After interest was confirmed by the other party, I never received any other word than that. And you know, after two months of just roadblocks, I decided, you know, if I can't get into prisons, then I need to transfer my project. While staying true to my initial project purpose, I need to transfer my project into something more feasible. Um, and that is when in mid-August, I decided to make the last big pivot of my project, which was to make a digital curriculum to help raise awareness about the prison health inequities to our future policy leaders and thinkers. Because I couldn't get into the prisons and make a direct impact, I decided to develop a curriculum to incorporate into classrooms here at Brown. By doing this, I'd be educating the next generation about these issues so that when they are in the position of power, they can make the changes needed within these systems. My purpose of my project is to alleviate vaccine hesitancy within prisons, and it is still being fulfilled just in an indirect way. And for the rest of this presentation, I'll be going over the creation and implementation of the curriculum into a Brown University course, Bio 170, 
I'd also just like to thank Dean and Chili. This is one of her courses and she just graciously allowed me to do this and I'll be forever indebted to her. Um, I will also share the reach and the impacts of the curriculum. So the first step in creating my curriculum was to establish the learning goals. Now, this was a bit difficult. First, I had to accept the fact that, you know, Bio 170 is not a public health course. I needed to make sure that my curriculum was complementing Dina Chili's uh, course goals, uh, not detracting from it. Thankfully, we identified a place for my curriculum within the weekly sections that were dedicated to exploring the implications of the material beyond the science. However, these discussions needed to still be relevant case studies to course material. Therefore, my learning goals had to reflect that. So the final learning goals were to identify various aspects of biotechnology that influence prisons, uh, prisoners' health and how they perpetuate disparities, analyze different ethical components of the prison healthcare system that biotechnologists need to be cognizant of, and generate potential solutions to these health disparities. Now, I'd like to take a moment and kind of discuss the guiding principles over why I made the curriculum, curriculum digital. Uh, these sections due to the pandemic were already virtual, so a digital learning environment just seemed fitting. Um, I also have some interest in CS, namely in the way that you're able to scale your audience through a digital curriculum. And you know, I could disseminate this website and this curriculum to other students not in the class. And that was very important to me for sustainability. I also wanted to incorporate multiple forms of media in creating the curriculum and a digital format allowed me to do that perfectly. And finally, as a former student and a current TA of Bio 170, I've been a part of these virtual sections as a student and a TA, and we have all been there where we go out into breakout groups, come back to share our discussions, and it's just radio silence. I wanted to think of a virtual solution to that problem in which the TAs could help truly guide discussions, which I'll talk more about when we explore the curriculum. But without further ado, this is the final product of the curriculum, um, which I will be sharing. I'll actually be going on to Google Chrome. We can see this, right? Um, just want to make sure that we can see this. I'm just going to pray that we can see this. So this is the home page of the curriculum. This is where the students would be greeted. Um, they can scroll down and you know learn how to utilize this curriculum and very quickly know why they should learn about uh, the health of prisoners. The main hub of the curriculum is actually module one, where they'd be introduced to this quote here just to garner attention. and they'd be introduced to that curriculum. As you can see already, there's different forms of um, media, for example, a podcast to learn by. Um, they can hit the right arrow and they'll progress on through the curriculum. Now, ideally they do all this material, they'd be engaging with this material before the section. And when they come into the section, they can go into their breakout groups to discuss these questions. Now, these questions are set up in a specific way where the students will have a central leader where they'll take notes over the answers and they'll submit it. Um, and these questions, the answers to these questions will then go into a backend server and get outputted onto a TA website. And that website basically just populates all these answers choices and allows for I and the TAs to know what the students are you know, discussing and talking about. Now that does two things. One, it makes it so that the TAs don't have to awkwardly go into breakout groups to see what the students are talking about. And two, when we're in the main room, it alleviates the vulnerability threshold that students need to uh, exceed to kind of share and summarize what their groups were talking about. Um, and it really helps the TA just guide that discussion. And a lot of TAs definitely found this feature very, very um, useful in guiding discussions. Obviously, I won't go over the whole curriculum, but if you're interested, uh, you can take a look. Um, you'd also have to sign in through your Brown email to, to look at it. But I will go back into my presentation. Perfect. So the reach. The curriculum was used by a diverse class range. And most importantly, it was used by a diverse background and interests. This is important because the public health policies and topics discussed in the curriculum are influenced and impacted by many of these fields, such as ethnic studies and economics. So it is great to see all these fields at the table discussing these issues. Next, talking about the impact of the curriculum and assessing the learning objectives. At the end of the curriculum, I surveyed all 177 students who participated in the curriculum through a 20 question anonymous Qualtrics survey. And the responses to the survey were just overwhelmingly positive. 
just as a reminder, the learning goals were to identify, analyze, and generate potential solutions. The students' responses clearly exceeded these learning goals as highlighted by these quotes. And you know, I would love to get into these quotes, but um, I can't, time does not permit that. But these quotes were just abundant and they clearly exceeded um, my expectations. Most importantly though, as educators, I think the biggest thing we want students to take out of a curriculum or a course is the ability to take that knowledge outside of the classrooms and apply it to their own lives, apply it to conversations with family and friends, apply it to their workplace. And you know, before the curriculum, most did not feel comfortable with their level of knowledge on various prison health disparities. However, after the curriculum, every student felt confident that they could at least start conversations about these complex issues. And I think this is my favorite and most, I guess, um, the, the stat that makes me smile and happy the most. Furthermore, students had great feedback about the components of the curriculum design. They loved that there were multiple forms of media and that they have not felt like this from any class in a long time. Additionally, a student thought that the automatic submissions was very cool to use and others just overall thought that the curriculum was very engaging. With every positive does come some negative, namely being accessibility issues with the website that will need to be improved moving forward. As I reflect upon my project, there is certainly work needed to be done in the future, and I hope to improve the website design that the students had talked about and create a module three uh, discussing systemic racism in a more holistic way um, and how that really perpetuates prison health disparities among subsets of, um, of the prison population. Uh, I also hope to publish a manuscript of my findings and also potentially um, conduct a senior thesis related to prison health disparities. And some advice to prospective Royce fellows is, you know, when doing community outreach, really know your audience. I know that's very basic, but you really forget that, um, you really forget about this point. I have numerous stories, but one that comes to mind is, you know, I was calling up the Omaha County uh, Jail and I was approaching it as if I was introducing myself to a professor at Brown. And I was like, hi, my name is Rashawn. I'm, I'm a junior studying this, doing this project. Do you have time to like talk about a collaboration? And they immediately thought that I was either a journalist or a lawyer trying to interrogate them and their work that they were doing. And that collaboration just immediately ended there. Utilizing your resources, again, with Jesus and Maggie around, it really is an independent research. Um, they were just amazing throughout this whole process and I can't thank them enough. And finally, don't be afraid to pivot. If there's anything that my research has um, taught you, I think it's that you really have to stay malleable when you're talking about independent research um, and be able to pivot. Thank you for listening. And I hope I was able to just uh, showcase just how important this project was to me. Thanks, Jean. That was great. Now we are, have time for q and I think there's like 20 minutes left, 25 minutes left for q and I'll just remind everybody who's still in the audience that we're here tomorrow and Thursday and Friday, every day from 12 to 1.30. Uh, the rest of the week will be completely online in the same Zoom room. Yeah. So we have questions for our four presenters today. You can use the chat feature or just feel free to yes. start, start talking. We have a question. Great. Hi, Regis. Hello. Um, not a question, but a comment. Um, I just want to say congratulations to all of the presenters. I mean, this was just incredibly profound, the insights uh, by all the presenters. I'm from New Mexico, and I just want to um, just say how extraordinarily proud I am of you, Ashlyn, uh, to articulate the challenges that come with our oral society's transition in finding new ways to transfer um, uh, knowledge to the next generation, but to the school and this effort. Um, I think this is a really extraordinary opportunity for young people to really just showcase the, the extraordinary and incredible intellect and the opportunity that is immediately transferable uh, with their um, research, their recommendations, uh, and how we can improve 
uh, on multiple fronts responding to such incredible minds uh, driven with a really deep sense of passion. So I just wanna say thank you to the school for this program, to the mentors and to guys such uh, profound examples of the next generation of leaders. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Regis, for joining. It's so nice to see you too, Kunda. Thank you. Other questions? Aja, you're up. Okay, hi, thank you. Let me take my hand down, oops. Um, let me take my hand down before I forget. Um, uh, I want to start by just, um, I, I um, was teaching, so I missed part of the first presentation, but um, I, I caught a good half of it. And um, I just want to congratulate all, um, all of you guys for, for just such wonderful work and, and doing such a great job presenting it. Um, um, as Ashlyn's um, mentor, I wanted to ask, I wanted to tell you in particular, Ashlyn, just um, huge congratulations. I really um, enjoyed your presentation a lot. And I, as you know, I really believe in your work. Um, um, I just, you know, so that was the main comment. Um, I, in terms of a question, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the sort of work that you see going forward in terms of gender and sort of like how that intersects with some of the things that you were observing about language and, you know, um, work on the land and, you know, work with plants. And and I, I have to say, like, I, I, I love, I love planting stuff too. And I always grow corn in my yard every year, even though it's hard up here in the Northeast, but um, I felt so bad about this, the, the storm that damaged your plants. It just made my heart hurt. Um, so I'm glad there was a happy ending to it. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts about, about your work going forward, particularly having to do with gender. Yeah, of course. Um, so I was actually talking to Professor Fuzofi about this. Um, and as I had mentioned in my presentation, planting is mostly seen as like a man's duty. Um, and also being that my father is Hispanic, I, I personally was never able to, to um, I guess do the planting from a young age either. So I was talking with Professor Fusetti and she was um, asking me about how there are certain gender roles that lean into land-based education, for instance, um, hunting and farming, um, you know, this might have been more of the past but because of being more acceptable for like women to do this stuff in the present. Um, but like farming and hunting are mostly for men, as opposed to like women are mostly um, the ones that are like in the home doing the cooking, um, doing more like the, the harvest work of um, like shepping the corn and like doing the after part of, uh, of the planting. So it's just mostly looking at um, ways in which like land-based education can shift from each gender. Um, but now that you had just said, and with my own thought is also maybe how it can even shift with whether a person is um, like mixed race or mixed um, with different ethnicities. Um, so that's mostly just what it's leaning towards. It's not fully thought out yet, but yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. Yes, thank you for coming too. You're welcome, thank you. Following my question from yesterday, I'm curious actually kind of building on that too, if people could kind of speak more about how this fits into broader work and kind of what you're imagining as the next steps, either kind of immediately or maybe more long-term and how this research relates. Do you want to start first? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for the Ballet for All Kids program, the ultimate long-term goal is for them to be recognized as an effective intervention for um, children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, this allows them to do one of two things. One, charge insurance companies, and two, be able to be eligible for certain state funding programs, which would allow them to be more affordable to their participants um, and allow them to just expand to different communities. Now, for them to do that, they need to generate a more robust scientific evidence base. If they need to have some sort of articles published and studied that show if 
that show like this is what this is how the program benefits this population. Um, so really, my project was just like step zero of that whole process and to just generate interest and inspiration for other people to come in who have more means um, to generate those larger research studies. You mentioned publication. You're saying we want to publish it. Who's the we about? And you mentioned like co-author too. Oh, so so on. So the manuscript is drafted um, and edited by me, the um, advisor, um, Professor Julie Strandberg, mm -hmm. and two founders of Valley for All Kids. So Bonnie Shalak is the main founder, and then Rebecca Elbridgen, who founded the New York City branch. And then we're trying to get co-author who is published who is like a researcher of autism mm -hmm. to try to bring some more credibility and just more um give their insight to it um and that's at the stage where we're right now because everything is dropped and ready to go we were just hoping to get like another round of edits and approval and then submit it so so it's a little challenging to contact that person. So if anyone knows anyone, <laughs> that would be very helpful. And then you're hoping to go to med school after this. Yeah, so I'm actually applying this cycle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's um, in May. Um, yeah, and how that fits into it, it's just kind of this promotion of art based interventions, not necessarily as like pharmaceutical cures, but definitely it's something that can supplement a wide variety of people's clinical care as someone who has done the arts for their entire life. I think I have a very good perspective on how, on the potential of this and how these sort of programs can be very beneficial. Uh, I guess very similarly, uh, I feel like very similar like steps zero sort of, like approach for this research. Um, I think the next logical step is for um, development of, as I mentioned a little bit, like trauma-informed uh, trainings for whenever people do post training for uh, opioid, like overdose prevention or like naloxone distribution, like, mm -hmm. those should be accompanied with uh, like materials or resources that let people know um, not only like what signs of um, these like secondary mental health outcomes might be if someone is like experiencing like um, trauma after responding, like how they can like deal with that, whether it be through like mindfulness or um, like clinical resources that they might be able to refer to afterwards. And so um, obviously there needs to be a literature base and um, part of the work that we did in the summer is like, I define that there is no literature base that's like quantitative, and so hopefully that will like provide the like impetus for more like funding to be allocated to these programs, and then hopefully we can do like interventions um, and like analyses of um, whether or not uh, like programs with these trauma informed like care practices um, have better like uh, outcomes down the road than um, like people who are trained without uh, this this sort of um, framework. Awesome. Do yeah, I, I can go. Um, sorry, I hear my echo, so that's <laughs> highly oh. I don't hear my voice. No, 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 no worries. Oh, thank you, thank you, Maggie. Um, uh, I think I think the, the question was future directions of, of my work, right? If I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, I think you know I really do want to um, improve the website. I had, had designed it. In a very, in a way that was specific to, um, in just terms of graphic design and accessibility, um, very quickly because I only had like a month left, and also um, I knew that most Brown students they use MacBooks, but I didn't really consider other forms of, um, you know, technology. So, for example, on your phone it's not accessible. So I really need to think about um, designing it and making it dynamic for other um, technologies. And also creating that module three, it's very important to me, um, um, that module three of discovering or exploring the issues of systemic racism. And like I mentioned, I, I'm really, really interested in this topic now. I think, um, you know, kind of like Noi, I have an interest in going into medical school. I don't know when that is, but um, I do want to make sure that it stays a part of my 
you know, career trajectory uh, to um, help uh, bring more attention and public health attention um, to this issue. Um, so yeah, I think I'm also wanting to do a senior thesis, a public health thesis on these issues. So yeah, it's definitely going to stay stay a part uh, of my life probably forever. Awesome, thank you. Is there another question? Anyone? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, they're all questions. questions. Maybe uh, Noi and uh, Ashley, can you talk a little bit about like your interviews and how that process works? And Nelson, you keep mentioning that there's like no quantitative data on mm -hmm. things. Is there qualitative data? Mm -hmm. How do you set up your interviews? How does that come uh, about? Um, I have a Um. So the interviews was very nice because the way we did it, the way we contacted them was um, the Valley for All Kids staff members contacted our participants. So they knew, because they already knew them and trusted them. So it was kind of the first round of vetting. There wasn't a lot of mistrust um, or hesitancy to the interview. Um, most people that were contacted like, did express um, some desire to be interviewed. I think the thing I think I struggled most with, like if people were very chatty, that was almost easier because you would ask them one question and they would ramble for like 20 minutes. And I thought most parents would want, who would want to get interviewed are excited about this opportunity and are excited to like gush about their child. And some parents were much more closed off and I would prompt them with a question. That was very open-ended and they would give me like a one word or sentence response. And it was kind of those interviews required a lot more active engagement um, and a lot more prompting. I think like I had an interview guide that had a that had a pre-established flow and questions and prompting questions. If an interviewee was a little more shy, and I think that was really beneficial. I think also really beneficial was kind of uh breaking up the more difficult and serious questions of following so one question was like can you explain or detail some areas that are challenging for your child and following that up with what are some areas of strength was really be beneficial because if they felt like because it wasn't and you just balance the positive versus some areas that were more difficult to speak about and it made um, I think people more open and comfortable mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as my interview process, um, it actually feels weird calling it an interview because it to me it was just mostly like I would ask them if I could go over to their house and if we could just eat over a meal. So like, yeah, it just was like a little funky to call it an interview. Mm -hmm. But um, I think looking back at you know my interviews as well, I definitely tried to like go above and beyond and be like I'm going to interview like 35 people and just you know do all this stuff but um you realistically it was nine and of course like it was multiple times um so I guess just the way the question was like how I went about it yeah um yeah it was just again like putting down the respect first um again bringing in that cultural knowledge and the cultural teachings of um asking them if like if I can talk with them just about anything um and similar to like what noise said is like sometimes the interviews i would ask a question and it would lead into something else and they'd be talking for she was like one time i remember we talked for about six hours um but i do want to say that first and foremost i am a santa clara Pueblo woman and i am a scholar second so a lot of times we get this like misconception of you are the one that's in charge of the interview. You have to be the one that are like guiding people. But for me, it was like, this was a time for me to learn cultural knowledge too, as opposed to making it be like, I'm a scholar and you have to tell me these answers and questions. Um, I always try to make it apparent that like, I'm here just, you know, for, for that, as opposed to like, this is just something that I need information for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the two of you did really great jobs of like modeling that sort of practice that it, yeah, maybe not interviews, but maybe that word, or not, I think not, not the right word. I also like in your project, like farming as a entryway into language learning. I wondered, and maybe this is part of like what you're talking about with the gender and land based education 
if there's other ways into like whether it's cooking as a as a form of language transition or translation or other practices as well. No, I definitely feel like there is. Um, I think like even just having conversations with my grandmother. Um, it's like I know in Hawaii they also use this model of like in the certain house, like in a certain uh, room in the household, you can only speak the the language. Um, so there's also that introduction of like okay maybe it's the kitchen where you can only speak the language. So even if it's like simple words such as like kutsada or like um, sijo, which is um, kutsada is Spanish borrowed, but like spoon and knife and like asking them how you mix this or main thought, like to make it, it's still like using the language. And I feel like I saw that with my little sister too, as she likes to make tortillas. Um, so my grandmother, you know, also helped her do that. She did learn the language through that. Just like everyday words. Um, again, language is everywhere. So you're able to, I guess, figure out exactly how to bring the language in at that moment in time. Yeah. Uh, question was like qualitative or like why I mentioned like there's no quantitative data. Yeah, um, also started yeah. with Macklemore, so I felt like there's like, there are like first person. Yeah, yeah. so I think um, a lot of the literature base that, so we did like a sort of a systematic like review type um, search a lot of databases and most of the literature is um, again drawing really heavily on um, people who are professionals and um, obviously that like population base has like they have trainings often and they're exposed to um, like they're often like in a group setting with like other people who are um, professionals and um, they have like support networks that are already in place as opposed to um, people who are like wow, this is like a very sudden, um, unexpected event. And so like, I feel like with like a professional responder, you're like sort of mentally prepared for the fact that you um, have to deal and um, like other people's lives are sort of your responsibility as opposed to um, like a lay person. And so most of the literature focuses on the professionals and then there's like some like commentaries or opinion pieces in like science journals that say, hey, there is this like, what happens to like people who aren't trained and um, there is just like, um, they're mostly calling for research in this area. And there's not really that like that out there. So I was really like ha happy and fortunate that we were able to like help provide some like preliminary input that couldn't fill this gap. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the governor's task force. Is this like, do you think that there's room for uh, interest in this? Within? I think so. Yeah. So we, we actually presented to them um, in January um, and it seems to be well received. And so just like the next step is to uh, meet with the COBRA, which is like the Center on like Biomedical like, Research Excellence, which also provides some of the preliminary funding for other people in my lab to help like support the structure of this um, and um, looking for ways in which um, this like data can inform like future like proposals to them to help like develop more trauma trauma informed resources for over expansion. Rashawn, great website. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I think this is great. Well, thanks so much. Thank uh, you so much, all of you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. We'll be back tomorrow for more <laughs> presentations. <laughs>